The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're coming to you live from the Warner Center in Woodland Hills, California. This is the home for Autism Live. It is also the home for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. We're thrilled to be here with you on this Wednesday morning. I have some new accoutrement you are seeing on the desk um, because we've had some lovely things sent to us from Thelma Lou, which you guys are going to see. We're going to talk with them on Friday. This is, this is one of my new favorite things on the face of the planet. This is a, 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 it's a 3D, you can feel all the, the crayon strokes. This was a picture that my son drew a long time ago. If you're wanting to commemorate some of your child's drawings, make sure that you're watching on Friday as we talk about that because uh, this is new technology, very uh, wonderful gift to give anybody, right? Uh, their child's artwork preserved forever and three-dimensional. You can feel the crayon strokes. It's amazing. Okay, uh, so this morning it's Wednesday, and we're going to be with you for the next hour live. And normally on Wednesdays we try to bring you Dr. Doreen Grampiche. She is not available this morning, so I have something extra special, fabulous for you. Vince Redman is joining us right now via Skype. He's, in fact, already on the phone with us. Good morning, Vince. And we had decided that it would be fun to have Vince for a full hour answering some questions that you guys have written in about common holiday-related and family-related things that maybe aren't even holiday-related. But uh, So Vince is going to be answering those questions with us in just a second. But right now, we want to let you know that this hour is still going to be interactive and you guys can be writing in questions for Vince. And so Traven is going to show you some of the different ways that you can write into the show. Uh, and ways that you can connect with us, different ways that you can watch. I do want to remind you that our homepage is autism-live.com. When you go there, there's a lot to do on the page. You can search videos. You can chat with us directly from that page by going to the chat button at the bottom of the page. Hey, the toy guide is active and live at the top of the page. You can click on that, and you can also look up old videos. So all of those things are available, and you can be watching the live show, which is a pretty fabulous deal, right? It's all free. It's not the only way to connect with us, but it happens to be a great way. By the way, once you go to autism-live.com, when you're there about six seconds, a pop-up jumps up and asks, would you like to subscribe? I just want to let you know subscribing is free and what it means is that every week at the beginning of the week you get a viewer guide that tells you who's going to be on the show. So uh, you, we don't send you a whole lot of other stuff because we know that we, you don't want to have your inbox full of messages just from us. We don't ever abuse having your contact information, but that's how you can subscribe. So uh, in any case, uh, we've got Vince here and we've got some questions that people had already written in. Um, so I'm going to start with that, but before I do anything, I want to say that, you know, Vince's credentials are um, impeccable, right? Um, Vince is, uh, and, and Vince, I don't mean to speak for you, but you're, uh, a, an amazing individual. Tell them a little bit about your background and, and how, what you've been doing for all these years. Eh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've been with CART, it's going on 27 years now, so I've been with wow. CART for, you know, almost since its generation, or its genesis back in the day. Um, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in California, and I am a regional 
uh, or a director of family services for CARD. So I oversee all the family uh, care concerns, uh, uh, you know, grievances, um, supports, you know, for for the Center for Autism, as well as a conduit to information for families in regards to different needs, different individual family dynamics that might come up. Um, in sometimes we even uh, provide counseling services for those families that are here in California. Well, and you're just an all-around remarkable individual. Everybody who works here loves Vince because we know that we can go to him with issues, whether they be, you know, uh, if a family is having a difficulty, we can go to him, and he's got some great uh, words of wisdom, sage wisdom, right? Um, but there's, you know, I've, I've run to Vince before when there's, like, an issue that I don't know how to resolve, um, you know, just in terms of working with people, right? He's just one of those wonderful people. So, um, so Vince is going to be answering your questions today. It's really important that we note that in this format, there is no expert in any field that can give individual specific advice. So Vince is going to be giving you information based on what people have written in. Um, but obviously he doesn't have the ability to know all the things going on in your home and in your family. He'll give you information of a general nature with that, which then you'll have to evaluate and see if it fits within your life right so that's sort of the deal here um, but Vince I'm uh, I'm gonna jump in here with the first question so this viewer writes in and says my son is on a keto diet for seizures now that it is the holiday season I dread it I used to love to go to holiday parties I don't anymore my son has grabbed food off of other people's plates and stuffed it in his mouth it's not only rude and embarrassing, but it also also puts him at risk for seizures. It is a parenting nightmare. I never know how to react and have been known to just freeze. Every year we get fewer invitations. What do I do? Just leave him at home, scold him in front of everyone, jam my fingers into his throat and make him spit the food out? It's such a nightmare. There's a lot there, Vince. Where do you want to start? <laughs> many, different, many different parts of that. I mean, let's start with the pre preparing, you know, or behavioral preparing, right? Um, we, they need to be, you know, that family, we, we need to be working on the behaviors of just grabbing things, impulse control, right? Being able to ask for things or uh, be able to use an augmented communication device to ask or request certain things. So the first thing that, that, that jumped out to me was his behavioral control, being able to not just grab things from people's plates, right? Being able to ask for something. Um, so that's something that needs to be worked on. That's something that just significantly needs to be worked on, not only at home, but out in the community. Now, with that, we want to look at you know, the next thing is the diet, right? Many of our families, many of our kids are on specific diets um, for different reasons. Some, you know, keto diet for seizures, some are gluten casein free diets for food allergies, and so forth. My recommendation and always, has always been to prepare for whatever party or environment you're going to go to. Make sure that you supply the food, snacks, um, and such a plentiful right for that evening or for that day or for that trip what happens if we put that burden on the host or the you know the restaurant or the you know the community that you're not going to get enough you're not going to get exactly what you need and also you're going to increase the probability that the child's going to want to grab other things however if we have a lot if we're able to prepare that environment bring a lot of snacks bring a lot of food for meal time so that the child has familiar foods has safe foods for them they're less likely to just start grabbing things because they're hungry right lots of snacks lots of foods lots of stuff that the child can eat and going back to that behavioral uh, control being able to ask for so looking at that question is two parts one making sure that the child is able to ask or demand for um, for food when they're hungry and then two preparing that environment by us preparing and bringing that food um, so that they have enough uh, food for meals, food for snacks, as well as food for maybe, you know, desserts and, and uh, after meal snacks that other kids might get. 
Okay, wonderful. So I love that because, uh, you know, look at Vince. He's so smart. And he's and what he just outlined for us is the antecedent modification, right? The thing you do beforehand. Um, and that's such an important thing to learn as a parent about all the things you could do to set yourself up for success rather than setting yourself up for failure, which is showing up without any food, your child being hungry, and then there is this smorgasbord at a holiday party in front of them where the food all looks good and, and it becomes an infraction. But what do we do, Vince, when, and I feel for this mom, because I've, I've been there when this kind of thing happens, um, where now you've, you've gotten there to the party and whatever preparation you did, and now a child takes something from another person's plate and it's something that they actually should not have and they're sticking it in their mouth. How would you recommend, like I wanna know as a hostess what to do, but for a parent, what do you do? Well, I think the first thing is, is again, communication, right? Making sure that the host is well aware of, of the child's behaviors and you know potential possibilities that happen. So if something happens, nobody gets concerned. Nobody immediately freaks out. Nobody, you know, they understand that this is something that's due to the child's special needs. Now, there's a couple things based on that question, is in regards to safety. If the if the child is in great risk of eating foods that that they cannot have, right? They might go in and they might have an anaphylactic shock or they might have seizures. Then those foods, you know, we want to make sure, if at all possible, aren't there for the child to have and or they're put in a location that the child can't immediately reach, right? So people eating at a table, people eating on a counter rather than sitting down low on a couch or on TV trays, those types of things. Could, could be, you know, something that could be prepared and talked about early, not at the, you know, not the day of the social event, right? That puts a lot of pressure on the host. However, if this is something that's prepared by the host and the family prior to the actual event, then it actually would be a lot easier to make sure that happens. Now, most of the food um, allergies that, you know, that the children have or, or um, items that they eat that aren't in their diet aren't life-threatening. So it's not something that has to jump out and get out of their mouth or immediately call uh, 911 for services. So when that happens, uh, my suggestion is, you know, have the child, if, if possible, apologize for for grabbing the foods and then ask appropriately for the food from the caregiver and then the caregiver can replace the food with appropriate food at that time um, but I do think that the child at that point and if the child doesn't have the ability to apologize the parent can quick you know can very easily apologize um, for that and let them know that you know he does you know he does, he's still learning how to ask for food and we're going to go ahead and continue to work on that. It's such a, and thank you for all of that, Vince. That's such great advice. Uh, but I'm just having a flashback to uh, years ago, uh, I took my son. We were covering an event that was a gluten-free expo. And we were excited to go to it. And they had all these samples. And, you know, because my household is gluten-free, I have a weed intolerance. And my son is on the gluten-free um, diet, but we're also on the casein-free diet. And then we both have food allergies that are separate from that. And even I have trouble keeping it all straight, right? So how could anybody else? But I remember that we were at a place and they had desserts. And, you know, first question out of both of our mouths is, it, you know, obviously it's gluten-free because you're at a gluten-free expo. Yes. And is it dairy-free, right? Because you're never sure at a gluten-free expo. Yes, it's dairy-free. So we start popping these things into our mouth. And I said, oh, well, this is great. What's in it? And she was like, oh, well, it's almonds. And I went, almonds? My son is allergic to almonds. Like, it just hadn't occurred to me to ask. And, and so now, you know, I'm like whacking him on the back and he's spitting it out. And the woman was mad at me and saying, please step away from the booth because it looked like he was, I was making him spit it out. And she was like, that's unsightly, get away from the booth. 
And I was like, well, you know, how about you, you know, it's this or we call the ambulance lady. And uh, so she was not happy with me at all. It was one of those moments that lives in infamy. Infamy. Uh, but hopefully we're not doing that at a holiday party. And if there is something, I know as a hostess, if somebody tells me that someone's coming who has a peanut allergy, for instance, I try to make sure that we don't have anything peanut on the menu and that we don't have anything peanut in the house for like a month beforehand because that's life and death, right? Um, so I never had occurred to me before um, that, you know, if, you, if your child has something that's that big of an allergy, you really should tell the host, right, Vince? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So then they can prepare, like you were saying, maybe not even having that as part of the menu or part of any recipe that they're making. And again, that preparation and communication prior to the event makes it a lot easier. If we don't do that communication and then we do attend the event, then it makes it much more difficult because we don't know what the recipes were made with. We don't yeah. know if um, food is going to be served that the child might not be able to, to have. And again, at that point, you can't tell people, please sit at the table, please sit here, and don't do that, you do that. Um, so I think it's extremely important to not to not be uh, uh, reserved about bringing these uh, concerns to the host because I'm sure if they're your friends and they're your family, they're going to be received well and that party's going to be a lot more successful. Now Vince, one of the things that I'm really a big proponent of in the holiday season is telling parents, a lot of times parents cancel and don't go to parties and don't go to things because of these and other issues. And I know that it's really hard. I know firsthand you go to a holiday party and there's a, there's a certain amount of socialization you're supposed to do as an adult, but you also need to stay on your kid and make sure that they're not, you know, grabbing food and, and stuffing things into their mouth. Because there's a couple of seconds there where if they went to grab something, if you were on them, you could block and stop and prevent it from getting in the mouth. I, like, what I would recommend for this parent is to talk to their ABA team about the potential for a therapist to go to at least one of these parties. Maybe there's an afternoon party that they can go to where the therapist could be there and work with the child about inhibiting that behavior like you were talking about. And then the parent gets to not only see it and see how it works and that it can work, but they also get a three-second break to be able to be social at a party too. What do you think about that? Absolutely, that's a great, a great suggestion. If therapists are available and the family is is up for having them be a part of that event, that is a fantastic natural occurring environment for the child to be able to practice the skills of asking for things, inhibiting their impulse control, um, being able to stay socially involved with the other kids, being able to use their, their language or their communication device to ask for things or to request um, you know, different breaks, activities, and, and so forth. So if the family is, is, is in agreement with that, I think that is a, yeah, I know when I was a therapist back in the day, I went to many holiday parties. I went to probably more holiday parties than I can think of, um, probably more, more for work than personal. Um, and it was a great opportunity to work with the kids on how to appropriately enjoy how to appropriately um, respond and have a good time at these types of events while getting their needs met in an appropriate way. It was a really, really good time. Well, and, and I can tell you that as a parent with a kiddo on the spectrum that there was a period of time in which I was like a hermit. I didn't go out because I didn't think that I could. Um, and so my son wasn't going to birthday parties and I wasn't going to the grocery store, you know, because it was just too hard. And my team said to me, this is, you didn't come to us to just have us work with your child in your home. Cause back then that was all there was. There was no center base. Um, they were like, you want your child to be in the world, which means we have to practice in the world and it takes time and it takes planning to take a therapist. And sometimes the first time you try to work it out, that's not when the therapist is available or you know there's like it really you have to be uh, like the finesse of an army general to make it all work out timing wise but I know that you all can do it because you do it on a regular basis with everything else in your life and the benefit of it 
is that your kiddo gets to go to the party, you get to right. enjoy the party, you get to learn how your kiddo can make it work at a party. Um, the hostess sees that your your child can be there at the party and is not having to you know jam things into his mouth or spit them out, and there's not this kerfuffle of you know taking things off of people's plates. They want to have your child there because they love your child and they love you, um, and and you know you don't. You don't continue doing it to every single party, but I'll tell you, you take a therapist to a party a couple of times, your child starts to know what the rules are, and you know how to uphold them. It's a really good thing. I like it a lot. And just to finish that thought, we don't want to let us as parents, don't let our anxieties um, prevent us from, from using or being able to um, participate in that event. Bless you. <laughs> uh, right? I mean, a lot of times it's anxiety about not wanting to communicate with the host or, again, not knowing what to do with our child um, when they're in social, you know, closed, intimate social events and so forth. And that's actually where we want to, instead of being the hermit, being able to reach out to the host, talk about everything that we talked about, um, but as well as being okay with having a therapist go so that everything that you said you can observe you can want and then the parents can also have a good time knowing that their child's having a good time and they too are learning through this entire you know this entire event it's wonderful and and vince has got a phone call we hope he doesn't have to take it um we're going to take a break anyway though vince and before i go i want to say hello to a couple of people who are shouting out online we want to say hi to angela who is writing to us from sunny atlanta we love atlanta uh safia who's saying good evening from england and ryan has been writing into us about how does this have to do with adults i am now wanting to make a life change i wish i would have started this change earlier in my life but i was very immature. Um, he writes that he's now 32, but that he feels that he, you know he's functioning at a 19 to 20 year old level in his mind. Um, and then he would like to talk about getting off of some of the meds that he's on and doing a more natural diet um, using food and nutrition instead of pharmaceuticals. And I gotta say, Ryan, if you did not watch Monday's show, I really want to encourage you to go back and watch Monday's show because we had Anita Lesko on the show. She is an adult who's on the spectrum, did not get her diagnosis until later, and she has had a big discovery. She is a, um, a nurse anesthetist and has done a quite a bit of work in the field of healthcare for individuals who are on the autism spectrum, especially adults. And she's got a book that's coming out in November, but you're gonna to wanna to watch her show to talk about how she was able to turn around some of the meds that she was asking to be asked to be on because of diabetes through a natural diet um, and the whole food diet. So I really wanna encourage you to check Anita out and follow her because she's addressing, uh, she has a book out that's just about healthcare for individuals that are adults on the spectrum. Um, so I encourage you to, to check that out. We're, we have more questions coming up when we come back. Uh, specifically, we're going to take on the mother-in-law at Thanksgiving. So stick with us. Don't go anywhere, you guys. Do you provide care services to someone with autism? Recently, more and more children are being diagnosed with the condition and getting the support they need as awareness grows. But what happens to these children as they grow up? It's estimated that over half a million youth with autism will turn 18 in the next decade, and they'll be faced with a very difficult reality. As children with autism grow up, their services start to disappear or become very difficult to access. Things like medical care, mental health counseling, vocational training, and more. All services that are still desperately needed. The loss of support that youth with autism face as they grow up is so severe that it's referred to in the autism community as falling off a cliff. Adults with autism need the same level of support they had as children to avoid falling off the surface's cliff. Introducing Skills Living, the web-based software designed specifically to help transitioning youth and adults with autism so they can avoid the cliff and instead fly to success. With Skills Living, help your learner with autism develop the skills they need in all the critical areas of adult life including self-control, planning, and problem-solving, effective communication,
performing life skill tasks for independent living, acquiring and maintaining employment or other meaningful activities, developing and maintaining social skills and relationships, accessing transportation and public services, and being safe. Skills Living includes a comprehensive assessment, a data collection mobile app, behavior intervention plan builder, and automatic progress reporting. It also provides a complete curriculum addressing 16 key areas spanning the entire range of functioning adulthood. Skills Living is easy to use and can be implemented by schools, parents, and autism service providers. Call or click today for your free demo and see how Skills Living can help your learner with autism avoid the cliff and instead reach their fullest potential. Skills Living. Wish. Learn. Become. Okay. Hi, I'm Rebecca Ishida. Say hi, Ethan. Hi. <laughs> My son was diagnosed with autism in November 2004. With Ethan, almost immediately, we noticed things that were troublesome that he just didn't sleep. He would vomit in the crib, there were a lot of sensory issues. Then you'd have like 20 of the trains lined up, and if you came in and took one train out, it just yeah. meltdown completely. No! Guttural instinct is to think that there's nothing wrong. Who wants to look at their child and go, there's something wrong with that child? You don't. You always want to see the best in your child. Will my kid be able to go to school? Will he interact with his peers? Will he be able to have a healthy relationship? Will he get married? I really thought that autism was like a death sentence. A lot of hope was given to me through CARD. This was my third agency, and the best agency we had. And there was no way in the world I was going to give up CARD because of the gains I saw Ethan was having. Hey, and I remember when Doreen saw us for the evaluation, she says, but by the time he's six, he will be recovered. And that's yep. exactly what happened. I'll fix that. Welcome back to Autism Live. Our very special guest today is Vince Redmond. He is a licensed marriage and family therapist, but a licensed marriage and family therapist who's had decades of experience working in the field of ABA with autism specifically. So he is uniquely qualified to answer our questions today that are of a specific nature, and you guys can be writing in questions too. We're really focusing today on family issues around the holidays and uh, mostly around Thanksgiving. So our next question, I promised you the mother-in-law question. <laughs> How do I deal with my mother-in-law and the way she scolds my son? We have explained attention-seeking behavior to her. She still insists on giving him a lecture whenever he does something she thinks is wrong. I keep telling her she's giving him attention. It falls on deaf ears. She is coming for the week of Thanksgiving. I keep thinking how much regression we are going to have help. So what advice when you can't teach the ABA to the mother-in-law, Vince? Maybe have someone else do it. Oh. Right? Maybe have the therapist. You maybe have therapy at home that week where grandma can observe, or grandma or mother in law can observe. Maybe have them attend a clinic meeting. Maybe have us, you know, arrange a supervisor observation during the time that she's around. Use the resources that you have around to maybe present the information in a different way, present it from a professional's point of view. Right. When it's coming from family, sometimes we just don't listen. Right. Especially when it's uh, an older relative, they feel that they might know more or, you know, the old school way is the way things need to to be uh, addressed. But by doing it by a professional, by someone who's an expert in the field, 
maybe that will open their eyes to a different approach on how to deal with things. Maybe they'll understand the negative attention cycle that happens when a child is acting out for attention and understand how to use an intervention. A lot of times they just don't know what to do. And if we give them exactly what intervention to do, sometimes it can be very, it, it can, can be very successful. So my, my advice, the first thing would be is to work with your ABA team and see if you can get other professionals there the week that your mother-in-law is there so that they can prevent or prevent present the information for you. I love this, Vince. You know, I, and this goes back to what I was talking about before. So the holidays are upon us and, and you've got people coming into town and a lot of times we think oh, life is going to be so complicated. We have to pick people up from the airport. We got stuff that we have to go do. I just need to cancel therapy. And then what happens is, is that your in-laws come into town, you're running around doing all these places, your child is getting less therapy, your in-laws don't see how the therapy benefits, and so they're saying, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. And it creates this environment in which they see that you didn't prioritize the therapy, so they automatically think, okay, well, obviously it's something that we can put on hold, and it just feeds itself, right? When in fact, if you were to do what Vince just said, not cancel therapy, maybe uh, have ask if therapy can happen in the home and have grandma there, or go shopping to the grocery store with grandma, with the therapist, and say, we're gonna meet you at the Safeway, right? And we're gonna go through, then grandma gets to see how the child behaves with the therapist. So she starts to go, oh, well, I see how important you're, you're making this. This is a priority. You don't cancel therapy even when I come to town. But then grandma starts to learn, and if you can say to your team ahead of time, and can you pl please show grandma how to do, you know, X, Y, and Z, uh, not when grandma's there, but have the discussion before, say this is, so if you see her starting to scold him, can you please address it? You'd be hitting it out of the park. This is brilliant <laughs> advice, Vince. Uh, I had one family that I worked with many, many years ago where we literally planned it was almost contrived what programs we were going to do with the extended family that was present not necessarily doing it with them but doing it in front of them doing it around them so that entire week was pre-planned so that we hit all the high behaviors all the things you know in regards to the child using their language and, and it turned out to be by the end of that trip Grandma was it was it was grandma I believe um, she was a hundred percent she was the biggest proponent now for ABA because not only she saw the success of what we were doing but I think she understood it now it wasn't just something you know just ABA and all these you know initials of treatments that they don't understand she actually understood what we were doing and that comforted her that gave her more confidence that what we were doing is actually going to show positive results and from that point forward she was all all on all on board yeah you get to buy in i have to say i tell the story all the time about how i told my mother she couldn't come and visit for the first six months that we were doing aba and then then i finally told her that she could come but i had a talk with her um, after i picked her up from the airport and i said here's the thing, you're gonna see some things and you're not gonna like them and you're not gonna understand them and, and I don't have the bandwidth for that mom. And this was my mom, I couldn't have said this to a mother-in-law, but I said, mom, I don't have the bandwidth for that. I want you to know we're all in on this. So I'm gonna ask you to give us your support or your silence. If you see something you don't like, I'm just gonna ask you to be silent about it because I don't have the bandwidth, mom, right? And, and oh, this did not go over well, right? Um, but then we were in this teeny tiny condo and I had a, uh, a baby monitor, I had a couple of them set up in the living room, they would do therapy. So my mother and I had to go sit in the bedroom. And my mother was a knitter and, you know, and she drank coffee, you know, by the pot load. And I, she would say, well, I'm gonna go get another cup of coffee. She was sitting there knitting and I was working. We were watching the monitor and she would say, I'm gonna go get another cup of coffee. I said, you can't. The next break is at this time and you, what? This is terrible. You're like a prisoner in your own home. And, and I was like, just watch the monitor, mom. And the first day they were doing things with him and she was like, this makes no sense. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my entire life. This is stupid. And I was like, you know, how's that support or silence thing working for you? <laughs> it was not, not going well. 
But I said, just, I just kept saying, just watch, Mom. Watch, because you're only seeing five minutes of it. Watch the arc of it. So they started on Monday, and they were teaching him characteristics of things and features of things. And, and she was like, this is, the, you're, you know, you're never going to get anywhere with this. This is, you know, craziness, right? And by the end of the week, um, they were, the, the therapist put a, 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 a Fisher-Price statue of a bird in front of him, and they said, Jem, what is it? And he said, it's a bird. And a bird has wings, and a bird has a beak, and a bird can fly. And, and the therapist was like, yeah! And my mother stood up in the bedroom and, and was screaming and crying and celebrating. And she was like, that's the most amazing thing. I watched them teach that. I, I didn't think that was going to work, but it, oh my gosh. And she just, she was like, this should be on the national news. This should be every night on the news because this is amazing if people only understood. And she was like, I want to learn how to do this. This is working. So that was the difference from Monday to Friday. But I just kept making her watch it. And, right. and then my mother was the biggest proponent. She was like, what do you need? How can I support? And if somebody would say something, she would go, that's not how we deal with this. Um, and, and it was such a turnaround. Right. Um, so I love your advice, Vince. Make them a part of, make them a part of it. Yes, abs absolutely. Okay. Should we take a break or you want to go into the next one? Sure. What's uh, next? Okay. So the next one, this, this one breaks my heart a little bit. The, the person wrote it in and said, I am resentful. I resent that my life is not like my friends. Their children are healthy. They have money. They all have husbands. I am alone with a child heavily impacted by autism. I am barely keeping a roof over our heads. I find the holidays really hard because it all seems so unfair. Where is my Hallmark movie? I don't want to be this unhappy. What do I do to get over resentment? In resentment, that's that's a very common feeling, right? I mean, there's a lot of grief, a lot of depression that, that goes through almost all our families that have special needs children. And there's different triggers in different times of the year that that might be uh, more pro you know prevalent and more uh, robust than ever. In the holiday time, sometimes that's the time. My suggestion is looking at the blessings that you have around you look at the things that you have around you that that you've succeeded with look at the successes that you've done look at the successes your children have done look at the successes that you continue to make despite having the odds against you despite having a lot of things going against you you continue to succeed your child continues to have treatment your child continues to learn and will continue to do better right reach out to those that are around you if there's not someone around you to reach out to um there's special you know uh, support groups that are around you there's um you know professional help that's there to listen and help guide you there's a lot of resources that you might not be aware of you can reach out to your aba provider and they can be more than happy to get you connected with other resources around you but don't overlook the, the success right you're working very very hard to keep a roof over the head, keep the food warm on the table, and to keep them in treatment. That is a bigger success than ever, right? There is no bigger success than being able to take care of your family and being able to take care of their treatment along the way. I love that, Vince, because this is a hard road, and, and the people that are on it are, uh, to me, they're superheroes. And recognizing that you are on a hard road and doing something that's fabulous is super important. The one thing that I would add is that over the years, and, and I wasn't a single mom, so heaven knows that I, I can't even imagine. Um, but when the holidays come up, I'm, I'm always reminded of, we had a couple of rough holidays where we didn't have two nickels to rub together and our kid was not speaking and I, you know, I was resentful. I was looking at all my friends going, you know, how is this equal? How is this fair? How is this even? And, and I know a lot of moms who have felt this way. And the one thing that we have found, uh, well, I will say that writing about it helped me. It, writing is the way that I can get things out because I can write anything down on a page and then throw it away later and I haven't hurt anybody by saying whatever the most horrible thing is on a piece of paper. That helps me. But the other thing that really helped me and I, I see help so, so many other parents is, it's going to sound weird, but finding a way to give to somebody else. So volunteering, uh, because you know what you find out? 
is when you go to volunteer and you see other people's stories, you see how lucky you are. And, and, and you know, it's that thing that they say about if, if all of us were to pass around a, a, a plate and put all of our, a basket, put all of our troubles in it, and then have it go back around, we would all take our own troubles back because we would go, oh, I don't want that thing that you have going on. But being able to help somebody else and realizing how many people have other stuff going on, I don't know why, but that really helps. It really, really does. Um, don't you find that too, Vince? Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I think it really is. It's communal, right? It's community. When we're helping one another, you feel supported as well as they feel supported. You have that reciprocity of helping others, and you feel that that you're giving back for all that you've asked for from the community, right? It's that give and take, right? You feel that you've taken and you need a lot of support from the community, but you also feel that you have a lot to give. And I think that's a great, great suggestion. Yeah. And, and you're so right, because you find community. When you start um, volunteering, you find a community of other people, and, and that's when you feel like you, you're close-knit. So you're absolutely right. All right, we're going to take one more quick break, and then we're going to come back with some more questions that you guys have written in. So stick with us. Lisa Ackerman, welcome back to Talk of Facts. Um, I, we hear questions all the time, and we want to give you the answers that help make your journey in autism easier and more navigatable. Less than a year ago, we interviewed the top 100 doctors in the United States working with children on the spectrum, and we asked them a question in the cloak of secrecy. What are the top three mistakes parents living with autism do? Number one. And my, the one that makes me laugh the most is when they use their physician as a marriage and family therapist. <laughs> one, the doctors told me it made them uncomfortable, and two, they were highly unqualified to provide that type of advice. So the night before your physician appointment with your MAPS doctor, get together with your spouse, significant other, and write out the list of the targets and the agenda that you want to cover at the physician's appointment. Get in sync then you'll be definitely spending less time and not making that doctor so uncomfortable. Second thing that was the most common mistakes parents living with autism make is they want to go too fast. And really, you want to pace yourself in the autism journey. We all know that we want to get our kid to be the best they can be and hopefully recover from autism. And what a lot of the doctors have told me is that you want to really pace yourself, one, to let the labs be your guide and to work with your physician on the prioritization and the, the delivery of the different medical interventions. The third most common mistake they felt families made was giving up too soon. And what you need to know is they're invested, um, they're looking at wanting to get the best from your child. But I tell you that when I got that and consolidated the 100 interviews with these physicians, most of the doctors who brought that up had tears in their eyes. Um, they want you to know that they're in the fight with you and they want you to know that hope is really real. It may take hard work and it may take time, but to not give up and to stay in the game. So let Taka help you. We'll have some more Taka facts for you in the future, real questions and real answers for the autism journey. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're here with our very special guest, Vince Redman. He is a licensed marriage and family therapist, but with decades of experience working in the field of autism uh, with ABA. So uniquely qualified to talk with us about the stressors that we have going on. I always tell the story about that when uh, my husband and I were about two and a half years into ABA, I, I had a really hard time. I mean, I, I had a breakdown. I became agoraphobic, couldn't leave my house. And at one point, we went to go to a counselor together to talk about some of the issues that we were having when you're doing a 40-hour program with a child because, man, it, it whew, that's hard. And the, the therapist said to us, well, I've listened to your issues, and it seems like to me you guys should stop doing ABA. That's the thing that seems to be... And, of course, both of us said, okay, thank you, and got up and left because that wasn't something we were going to stop doing. We needed to learn how to manage the stress so we could... That would be like saying to somebody, oh, you know, we'll stop doing chemotherapy then because that's stressful. Yes, it is, but it's necessary, right? Um, so we're so grateful that we have somebody like Vince who gets it and can tell us 
here's how you want to make this work. So Vince, we have our next question is about a sibling uh, question. This breaks my heart too. My son, not with ASD, recently told me he feels like it's never about him. She says, this cut me to the core. I am doing the best I can, but my four-year-old who is nonverbal with ASD does take a lot of my time. How can I do better for my 10-year-old who is not on the spectrum? The, the first thing is, is now you know the information, right? A lot of times we, f we believe that the siblings aren't aware or that they're able to maintain um, the, you know, just, just fine as we give all of our time to our, uh, the, the special needs child or, or sibling. But what the, the 10-year-old is now saying is, is hey, I, I, I'm over here and I'm not getting enough attention. That's good information. Don't look at that as a bad thing. Don't look at that as a negative. That is good information because now you are aware that there needs to be better balance within the family, right? So how do we do that? How do we pick up the better balance? Now, obviously, it's a little bit difficult because I don't know the family situation, but we want to look at trying to individualize time for the 10 year old. It could be with dad, it could be with mom, it could be with both, it could be with grandma, it could be with grandpa, whatever. Make sure that we're trying to find individual time to highlight that child's success, that highlight or highlight their um, desires and, and, and things that they're involved in, things that they're participating in, right? You're not going to stop the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, participation of ABA. You're not kind of what you were just talking about, Shannon. You're not going to stop the day-to-day -day participation in their treatment. Treatment's not going to stop. However, what we can do is look at how can we balance it? How can we not only maybe uh, individualize the sibling and give them some more uh, time and more of our attention, utilizing what we you know our community, our own personal community and family around us, but also how can we uh, get in, you know, get the sibling involved maybe a little bit more in treatment? Maybe they can become a little bit more involved and understand a little bit more what's going on. Maybe participate a little bit more in some of the social opportunities. Now they're a part of it. Now they're getting a lot of attention from the therapists that come to your home. Or they get to stay at the center for an extra half an hour and participate with the kids that are there. They feel included into the treatment rather than the treatment going on around them. So I think equally balanced, you want to make sure that you're looking at giving them individual attention for the things they're doing and participating in, but as well, maybe include them a little bit more in treatment so that they get that reinforcement, they get that attention from all the professionals that the sibling is getting attention from as well. Absolutely. Uh, and, and all I can tell you is that I know that when parents, it's hard. Like I, I, I don't, I don't know how hard it is because I don't have more than one kid. But I, but I've seen so many parents, and when they figure this out to the best of their ability, and that's all you can do to the best of your ability. What I have seen across the board is that the kiddos who are siblings grow up to be the most incredible people. They are kinder. They're more flexible. They are so giving. They are. Um, Patient, yeah, and they. I see that they see people for who they are, not how we would like them to be, right? So they're very accepting of of. They are the people who are teaching us all about inclusion. That's what it is, and they're amazing. So, um, you, I love that this mom is going to work on it because um, that's super important that everybody is seen and heard, right? But I want to I want to put it back to you that it's going to be okay and that he's going to turn out okay because these individuals are are amazing absolutely amazing so uh and we've got just enough time for this last question vince uh somebody writes in and says i feel like my marriage is ending nothing is really wrong but years of autism have left us being roommates we aren't fighting. That would almost be a blessing because then I would feel like I had a reason to leave. I would like to stay together for our son, but I don't know how to fix this. And I don't want to be in a loveless marriage like the guy on Jeopardy. What do you suggest? Did you hear about that? The guy on Jeopardy who went... So apparently last week there was a guy... And when, you know, when they asked, tell us a little bit about yourself, I didn't see it, but I heard about it, that there was a guy 
who said, oh, well, I'm trapped in a loveless marriage. And that there's been this outpouring of people going, oh, no, I think that's me. I think my husband would say that or I would have said that, but I wouldn't have had, you know, the nerve to say it. So uh, how horrible. So what can the, I, I'm assuming that this is a mom, but it could be a dad. Um, what can they do to sort of reignite and get close again, Vince? Right. I mean, well, I, again, without knowing the person, you know, the specific details of, of the relationship, I can give some some general general advice. First, you're not staying in the marriage for the child. That 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 notion of staying in a marriage for the child is is not healthy for the child nor for you guys. You want to stay in the marriage for the for you, for the family, for the couple, right? For everyone, not for the child. You want to stay in the marriage for you. And if you want to stay in the marriage, then we need to figure out better ways of communicating, better ways of finding the joy in the relationship again. When was the last time you guys did something together? When was the last time we sat down and just can we just talk to them with one another? When was the last time that you did something for your spouse and vice versa? When was the last time your spouse did something thoughtful for you? Right. We need to go back to the grassroots of where did this relationship start? How did it start and what kept it together? And then we need to replicate. We need to have date nights. We have to start doing thoughtful things for one another again. You know, we need to start looking at what are the barriers to our communication. My strongest advice to this is don't try to do this alone. Immediately try to seek out couples counseling, someone who can help guide you through this, because right now it's the fog and trying to go through it and navigate through is going to be incredibly difficult when you can't see what, you know, kind of how you got to where you got to. Please seek out, you know, someone who can help guide you through this and get you back to those grassroots, get you back to where did the enjoyment, where did the joy, where did the love come from in your relationship? And then try to find those barriers that are preventing that from happening again so that you guys together can tear those down. Wonderful advice. And I think uh, sage advice for pretty much every autism couple that's still together. You know, years ago they had all these statistics about how First of all, uh, couples that have neurotypical children, uh, what is it, like 50% of all marriages end in divorce? And then they were saying that if your child was special needs, that it was something more like 78%. I've heard as high as 84% of marriages. Now they're saying that that, that that number is a little inflated and it didn't take into consideration other things. But there's been another study that came out that showed that the families that do stay together tend to be closer. Um, and I think that's probably because it's something that has to be worked on. I mean, you've been married for how long, Vince? I have been married for 25 years. 20, I mean, you know, so I, and I, I, I didn't mean to bring it to a personal level, but I think that that goes to show why this advice is so important from Vince, because you can't have been married 25 years without you know, having to work on it. And, I, you know, I've seen him together with his wife and they're a wonderful, wonderful couple. I, I cannot believe that I have been married now for 17 and a half years. I don't know how that happened. Only because I think my husband is very flexible and has a sense of humor. <laughs> Otherwise, I, nobody expected for me to be married for 17 years, least of all me. Um, but I, on a daily basis, I see that, Man, it, it's got to be on the agenda. And I always remember what Temple Grandin said to me the first time she met me. She said, are you still married? And I said, yes. And and she said, well, you know, I, I tell parents all the time, you got to have time to, to yourselves. You got to have date night. You, we have to figure this out for parents. And I, I sat there and I was kind of freaking out. And at one point she said, what's going on right now? She read my face and I said, well, I, I just like, I, the reality that I'm getting marriage advice from Temple Grandin and, and her thing to me was she said well I, you know, I've never been married but I'm, I'm a problem solver I, I can look at a problem and I can figure out what has to be done and what has to be done is that we have to find a way for autism parents to have time when it's not about their kid and, you know, that was, I don't know, eight years ago that she said this to me. And I have a kid who's doing really well, and I, I can't seem to figure it out, Vince. So I do think, you know, like, how do you get the time 
to spend together and not talk about your kid uh, like I honestly it's hard and sometimes talking about the kids is what needs to be done yes sometimes you have a parent that's you know that that is removed from the treatment or removed from the family and they it, it, it we do need to bring that back to the family but then sometimes it has to be about the couple and just about each other and not about the family so again not knowing the specific family dynamics it could be one or the other or a little bit of both but what needs to happen is that couple needs to be tended to right the the, the dyad of the of the the husband and wife needs to be um dealt with and it needs to be attended to and it needs to be um you know given attention and it needs to be you know reunited again that's oftentimes what the first thing we sacrifice for family is the couple and that balance needs to come back i but i love your advice about don't try to do it you're on your own uh try to go for comp couples counseling sometimes that's included in your insurance then there are other places that get do it on a sliding scale but uh a really important thing to do vince you've been truly fabulous i can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us uh, today and where can people obviously if they're a card family uh, as the head of the card family services department where can they find you they can email me at v dot redmond r-e-d-m-o-n-d at center for autism com okay and we thank you so much for for taking this time and for always being there and being the wonderful uh, voice of reason so often that we can run to. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Uh, and I just want to say here, at the, while we've got a minute and a half here, that on tomorrow's show, you know, it's already Festival of Toys time, you guys. So on tomorrow's show, we have Jim Garber from Discovery Toys. If you were watching on Saturday when I was at the Family Fun Day uh, for the Center for Special Needs, they had, uh, there was an independent, um, I don't know what they call them, he'll tell us tomorrow, uh, but somebody who is a distributor of toys, that's, I think that's the word, uh, that had a booth there, and so I was going on and on about the toys. I think we have three winners from our catalog that are Discovery Toys, so we're going to be talking with Jim Garber uh, from Discovery Toys and showing those toys. It's my favorite time of the year. If I like, I, if I could just demonstrate toys forever, I would be a happy camper. Um, so he's going to be on the show tomorrow. Then on uh, Friday, uh, and also uh, I'm trying to think. Yes, yes, yes. No, um, that's tomorrow. So tomorrow we uh, Friday, excuse me. We have Ifunanya Nwiki from Jazz Hands is going to be with us. A uh, wonderful, incredible young woman talking about their new program coming up. Uh, and, and just love that. And by the way, it's Jazz Hands for Autism. Let me make sure that I get that right. And then we're also going to have Darren Phyllis from Destroyer Toys is going to be with us. And Thelma Lou. I mentioned before, uh, this is one of our winners from the Toy Guide. So Thelma Lou does all these one-of-a-kind gifts. So look what they made for me, this lovely Autism Live sign. But what you can't see uh, is on the back, it says, today is going to be amazing. So this is going to sit next now on my desk and then every time I see it just in the last couple days I've been like well that puts me in the right mood right um, but they do all kinds of personalized gifts they're the ones who did the the, the coffee mugs for us so uh, it has my the autism live logo on it and it's personalized so that I I know that this is my cup and nobody takes my cup right uh, we have great ones that we're gonna be rolling out that are for guests but this this is my favorite thing ever um, okay, so this is, uh, it's a piece of metal, so it's, it's never going to be able to be destroyed. And on it, I don't know, they laser put on it and, and it's got texture to it. it. This is an actual drawing that my son did when he was in second grade. It even has his signature, which they blew up because it was small and in the corner over here. But they blew that up. That is his act, like I just, I can't feel it enough. It's raised. And even the crayon, um, the, the brush strokes are raised so that I can feel it. This will never be destroyed. And I can proudly display this, and it reminds me of a time uh, that was different, right? A different time. Uh, this, is not, But I love the little doggy here next to the, the snowman. This is part of how he viewed the world. 
and I have it forever. It's not in a box, like, you know, turning into dust because it's paper. I have it forever. So this is a, a, a great gift for anyone. You want to want to make a gift for, gift for grandma. You have your child do a drawing. You want, like, I, I hope my husband isn't watching right now because I'm going to give this to him for Christmas. Um, it's like, I'm going to treasure this forever. It's not too late to order these for Christmas. In fact, now is the time to do it. So we're going to have a uh, wonderful mom, Carrie Mallory Tobbins, on the show on Friday to talk about Thelma Lou and all the personalization gifts that they can do. She's an autism mom. She's been on the show before, but this is now her business. And I had, she's been doing all these other things. And I was like, Carrie, all these other things are wonderful. And I'm going to order, you know, some hats and mugs and things because we need them to promote Autism Live. But this is the most fabulous gift that you could give a parent on the autism spectrum. So that's why it's in our, our toy and gift guide because it is the ultimate gift for a parent. Um, and I, I now I've, I've seen her do them before on plexiglass so that they're clear. And I don't, I don't know if she's still doing that, but the metal is fabulous because it's never, you, you can't break. It's not going anywhere. I love it so much. Like I, I, I wept when I saw it. So uh, that's coming up on Friday as well. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.